What's up, what's up? It's time for Done Way Past Funny. With your host, G.D. Fenderson. Join us as we take a look back at the early works of seasoned comedians before they were seasoned with this week's guest, Dr. Holly Sawyer. It's time to get down and get dope with Done Way Past Funny. Hi, welcome to Done Way Past Funny, where we look at the work of seasoned comedians from before they were seasoned. I am your host, G.D. Fenderson, certified forensic humorist at large but I'm losing weight. Joining me is comedian, actress, psychotherapist, Dr. Holly Sawyer. So how's it going, Holly? It is going good. How are you? Thanks for having me, GD. I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing great. Now, you know, so I should have checked this before. Uh, at the bottom, there's a scroll there. I just want to make sure that's all good uh-huh. for you. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just don't. I just don't use my last name. My 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 stage name is Dr. Holly, but I just don't use my last name. So. Oh, okay. So, because oh. but the website is drhollysfunny.com. Yep, but that's good. Right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, well, matter of fact, I can get rid of the story if you want. I'll do that now while we're live. Live. I'm live. Dr. Holly. Yes. So, um. If you don't mind, let's let's start off with you telling the people a little bit about yourself, how long you've been doing comedy, where you situated, uh, and if there's social media that they can stalk you on, whatever social media you want them to stalk you on. Or okay. okay. So my name is Dr. Holly. I am a comedian based out of Philadelphia. I have been doing comedy since January of 2022. Um, I started out taking a class at um, Helium Comedy Club here in Philly. Uh, My first showcase was in April. So I guess what, April 2022? I don't know, but 2022. So two, almost three years. Um, My day job, I am a therapist, but I save lives at night in all of the comedy clubs near you throughout the country telling jokes. I also act. I do improv. I write. Um, I'm a wife. I'm a mom. And yeah, I, I kind of wear all those hats, but yeah, comedy has just definitely been, um, my, my jam, my second or third life, if you will. (laughs) Now I have to ask you this because it's, it's obligatory. It's actually in my contract. Whenever I have someone who's a doctor, how often do people say to you, what's up doc? And when did it stop being cute? (laughs) And when did it start being annoying? Oh God. Um, first of all, it's not annoying. It's not annoying because I think it's funny. It reminds, it reminds me of like, uh, you know, Bugs Bunny. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I get it at least once or twice a week. Oh, okay. It, yeah. It's, it's more common than you probably think, but yes, but I don't find it annoying. I find it funny. It makes me chuckle. So I don't mind when people say it. And I think it's enduring. So, you know, I think it's, yeah, I think it's done out of love and respect. So I'm, I'm cool with it. Well, I usually ask because I, um, because well, the reason why I put in the part about annoying, because a lot of times people say it like it's the first time you've ever heard it. <laughs> so, oh, okay. Yeah, and so and they always and a lot of people think it's like I'm so I am so creative with that line <laughs> with that what's up, Doc? <laughs> like no one's ever said it to you before. You know, I know my my and especially like of course. And what made me think of it is my brother. Uh, when I whenever he saw me, he always said to me. You look like that actor, Predator. And he would say it every time, like it's the funniest thing. And he would laugh so hard, like he just thought of it, even though he's said it to me. Like, oh, well, that's cute. He, but no, it's annoying. See, that's what I say. See, this feels like it's cute. See, I think that's just your personality. I think if you were me, you'd be annoyed by it. It's like, all right, yeah, what's up, Doc? Nobody's ever said that before. No. Uh, You're just more pleasant than I am. That's all. <laughs> now I can see. So now, so I asked you that one. Here's now, see, most people who go into the psychotic arts, uh, they go to figure out how to fix them, the, a loved one or a situation, while most comedians become comedians because of a flaw in themselves. So, since you're both, how screwed up were you and your family? No, no, no. no. <laughs> All the way screwed up. All the way screwed up. All the way. Nothing normal, nothing normal at all. Um, 
my mom was uh, 16 when she got pregnant with me, had me at 17. My father was 18. So I am a product of two teen parents. Wow. Um, yeah. And my grandmother helped my mother uh, basically raise me because, again, she was a, a teen mom. So you're the so, oldest then? I am the oldest. Okay, I'm the, I was, I'm I was the, hoping because I know you have a brother. I do. I do. Okay. I have two brothers. So two brothers, I'm the, sir. yes, I'm the oldest and the first uh, grandchild, uh, you know, and then I have two younger brothers. Um, so that was kind of, you know, unusual, you know, back then anyway, because again, right. I'm a, I'm a Gen Xer. So having, you know, not that your grandmother raised you, but just that teen mom now is not, you know, uncommon, but growing up with your mom and having, you know, somewhat close in age. Um, so no, my background definitely is not anything <laughs> normal. Now, it's, you said you were, you just said you're a Gen Xer? Yeah. Now, at, now because you're, now you're, you're a psychologist? I am a master's level licensed therapist. So a psychologist like is someone who um, has a PsyD and they basically, they are, they are therapists, but they specialize in assessments. And then someone who is a psychiatrist, they prescribe medications. Well, I said psychiatrists so they prescribe medications. That's yep. why I like them. No, I'm yeah. just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I don't, actually, I don't want them in my head and in my body with the medication. I don't want that, but. No. Okay. no. I'm joking. Psychiatrists are cool. I mean, they're helpful. Well, the reason why I asked is because you said Gen Xer. Now, as a someone who's a therapist does it work towards your advantage or against you it, it, and because in the, in theory you treat everybody as an individual you know whatever their issue is but but then you if you have this convenient box like gen x gen z gen y gen whatever um the tendency is to think that they have similar issues when basically we all have the same the same issue, and that's the human condition. Yeah. So I was just wondering how the boxes, if the boxes help or hurt. Um, I think it's a I think it's a combination of both. I don't want to say like it's the either or or black or all black. No, you have people. to. It's my show. It's an either or. No, I'm not Stephen. No. <laughs> no, I think being a Gen Xer, I I always represent that because I think we are the most forgotten generation. You always hear about this rift between millennials and boomers or you know Gen Zers now, right? And so I think Gen Xers all often forgot. Um, and so I love to represent and just to, you know, make sure that people understand where I'm coming from as, as far as generationally, because there are many of my jokes that go into uh, what it's like to be over 45 and having children who really don't get like when you don't have money and you're poor and what is what is that, you know, what does that look like? Um, but I for me, when I'm in certain rooms and. I have millennials there or I have Gen Z's or Y's and they don't get being over 45, mm -hmm. then it doesn't work necessarily for me. But I still find a way to connect and laugh with them. So I think it can be helpful. Um, and sometimes it cannot, depending on who you're in the room with. Right. Yeah. Now, your audience that you perform to most is there do you are there a lot of gen x gen z or what it what is your fan base mostly consist of my my fan base is mostly gen x um and boomers um i i can connect um i guess you would call them with the uh the zennials or the millennials that are kind of like born in like the early 80s, but not quite Gen Xers. Um, right. But people who, again, who are in their 40s or who are in their 50s and 60s and kind of can go back with me as I talk about, you know, just aging and being a mom, people who are married. So even if you are not in those generations, but you are married, you can relate to probably some of my being married jokes, or if you're not married, but you are a mom, you probably can relate um, to some of my mom jokes. Uh, not to not to put a spin on dad jokes, but just being a mom and navigating um, that space. So my jokes really come from my experience, again, as being a wife, a mom, a therapist, um, and then just falling in that generational um, age gap. I, I tend to I tend to personally stick there. I think it's kind of you know still proof. Now, my my audience base is mostly 
I don't know if you've heard of this group. They're called the One Footers. I <laughs> know. Yeah, they're because they're so old, they have one foot in the grave. And so <laughs> my, my, my base is like dying off. So I older than boomers? Oh, well, I'm 65. So my base is my age and or older and around the same age. But yeah, they're so we're one foot in the grave. Okay. They're all, yeah, they're, they're all one foot in the grave. So I, I, I lose three or four fans a, a month. At, by, and I'm like, oh, that's too bad. I lost another fan. I'll go to the funeral and do a set, you know, go to show up at the funeral and do a joke, you know, say so this was there. This used to always make them laugh. Like, who the fuck are you? It's like, oh, oh Fenderson. They used to come. They, oh, that's right. I forgot. Old people don't share on social media. You don't know they used to come to my shows. Never mind. So. Yeah, that's a dream of mine. I would love to do a uh, a comedy uh, performance at a funeral. Oh, here's the thing. I Funerals are really easy to make people laugh if you just, you just have to, because the people are grief and, and, and grief and, and laughter or happiness are so close. They are like, they're just, they're like two twins. They're like yes. pleasure and pain. Yes, they're like, they're like exactly. Pleasure and pain. They're like, and my my philosophy, you know, my, my philosophy is that pleasure and pain are they're like twins that never leave far from the other. So if you have one, the other one is like close behind. They're mm -hmm. like almost inseparable. Like they're two separate entities, but they're always together. And mm -hmm. so if you see pain, pleasure is right behind it. You can see pleasure, pain is right behind it. Mm -hmm. You know, but I agree. I'm just a. But I have a philosophical bent to the left. <laughs> it's the, no. <laughs> so, so, um, now, so let's let's do this. I, I talked about your fan base. I'm okay. gonna the the clip you sent me was at the Comedy Factory. I think I want to say I sent you "Don't Tell" um, out of uh, Minneapolis when I was there a couple months ago. Well, you want to tell me that, but what it, no, I'm just because I it. never did the laugh. I never did laugh actually, so it had to oh. be uh, from um, okay, don't tell comedy. Well, I'll tell, well, I'll tell you what, then we'll watch it and then you can set it up. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Okay, good. Here we go. Are you guys having a good time? Yeah. All right, all right. Thank you. As Rick said, my name is Dr. Holly. I am a licensed clinical therapist. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's very rewarding. But the thing is, I fucking hate people. <laughs> oh. My baby brother, he's getting ready to have another baby. I'm excited, he's excited. So I say, what do you want this time? A boy or a girl? And he says to me, sis, I just wanted my dick sucked. <laughs> it took you six kids to figure that shit out? <laughs> Clearly my brother needs therapy. And a high school diploma wouldn't hurt either. <laughs> You know who else I hate? The motherfucker that woke up and decided to ban plastic bags. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Thank you. Like, what did plastic bags do to you? You gotta have some real fucked up shit going on to wake up to just decide to ban a piece of plastic. <sighs> and so a lot of our mentalists, they're like, what's well, Dr. Holly? Plastic bags are bad for the environment. Yeah. So is killing black folks. Where's the ban on that shit? Yeah. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. So I'm a mom with two teenagers. And um, my son, he's 15. Uh, and he's the only black boy in his high school who loves to play ice hockey. And I'm like, damn, why don't more black boys play ice hockey? Because if you think about it, it's the only sport where a black man can beat a white man's ass and not get shot by the police. <laughs> Come on, I need the black boys to step it up. <laughs> so I see you're not afraid to touch, or touch on social issues. Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, that was actually my uh, showcase 
um, last year at the Comedy Cellar in New York. I took um, a comedy class there with uh, Rick Comer, and it was a blast. I, I have like different videos, so I, I I couldn't remember which one I sent you. But yes, that was my my showcase comedy show at at Comedy Cellar. And you said Rick Comer. C yes. C O. Yeah, C O M E R. He's um, done uh, or written episodes um, and worked with Jerry Seinfeld, Sarah Silverman. Um, yeah, Rick is a Rick is a really good guy. I'm gonna take your word for it because I don't know him. I'm, okay. Because <laughs> I mean, he could be a prick, but he's nice to you. That's fine. I'll I'll just you know I'm not going to challenge you. I don't know. <laughs> I will I will check him out. I'll check. I'll ask people who know him. Or other people. I said so. You know, Dr. Hunt mm -hmm. says Rick Coleman is a, whoa, whoa, I didn't mean to trigger you. I just said, I didn't even, all I did was say his name. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> so what, what do you remember about the first time you did, the first time you were on stage and did comedy? Um, I just remember shaking the entire, the entire time I was shaking. Like I'm holding the mic, but I'm just like shaking. And so I'm like moving so the audience, if I stood still, would not see my shaking hand. So I kind of like moved and was touching, you know, the cord because that my hand would not stop shaking. I was so nervous. So what kind of feedback did you get from it? Um, I think people were nice because, again, it was a graduation showcase. Not this one, but my one at Helium. Um, right. But, but. My husband is very honest and he'll tell me like, okay, this landed, this didn't, you need to do this and do that. And so I appreciate him um, that, um, you know, just, just being honest, like he definitely loves comedy, but he'll let me know like, okay, you might want to change or adjust or do this or that. So I, I appreciate him for that. Now, since you're married, I, I, I like to ask this of all married people. Um, have you ever been in a fight with your husband and he says something really stupid that you really want to make into material. Uh, and so do you like, do you break, do you pause the fight so you can make a note? Say, oh, he just said this. Or do you like let him win the fight so you can just have it over with so you can go write it down? You know, but he just said something that's it's just gold. It's gold. And you don't, you don't want to fit that because you know how it is. You get an idea in your head and it could go. And, you know, so you want to get it down as soon as you can or at least some kind of record of it. How do you, what do you do? So <laughs> it is, it wasn't an argument or a fight per se, but it is something that he says that I have um, thought about writing as a joke, but I just got to figure out how to do it. Uh, but um, my, my husband is from Philly. And so he misses pronounce sometimes <laughs> Massachusetts. It okay. says Massachusetts, and I. It's not even like him. It's the Philly thing, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. What the it's hell? Usual. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, what the hell? No, it's Massachusetts, and in Philly, they say newsy instead of actually nosy. So I think I don't know if people would find that funny, but I find it funny how certain words I'm I'm noticing with people who have Philly accents or from Philly, they just pronounce it different than <laughs> what I would say. Now. <laughs> Have you have you ever have you ever shared uh let's say a premise or a joke with your husband in advance and he goes, oh, that's not gonna work. And then it and then it does work. Do you do you rub his face in it? Do you like show the tape, says, see this? You said this wasn't gonna work. See that those are people laughing at what you I'm not listening to you anymore. You don't know anything about comedy. No. <laughs> um, I think that has happened. I can't remember the joke. I think it has happened, but um I have definitely showed him the tape and done it. I told you so, because I'll say this: he has a Seinfeld type humor. Oh, so, he's, so, I, so he's not very bright. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm kind of like a. I can't. I, I'll just say I'm not. You know what? I would say he's more Seinfeld, and I'm probably Larry David. Okay. Uh, and so sometimes our what we find funny can sometimes clash, but, but, but we don't necessarily always agree, but the stuff we do agree on has been hits or something. I'm like, no, nah, I'm gonna keep it this way. Cause I go to these mics, I go to these shows and I'll get feedback from other comics too. And like tweak it like that. So it, it just really depends on what it is, but I do value uh, his, his input and his opinion. Cause guess what? When I get into that room, I'll know for sure. So, yeah. 
Yeah. Now, sometimes, sometimes though, you could have something really, really good, and it it just hits with a certain audience and not others. And so you that's can, true. You have to know, like, you do. some some materials so golden that either yes. you, either you can rewrite it for a different audience, or you can you know just set it up or surround it with other material that will beef it up for that audience. Yes, that's because true. Some, some things just golden, and you know it's you know it's golden. You know it's funny. And even yep. if everybody doesn't get it, it's, you know, it's like you don't, because I've, I've seen a lot of young comics abandon perfectly good premises. Yep. And I don't and, get rid of material. No. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll say to like, uh, here's like, uh, there's one, one guy who was, he's, he was doing his, uh, he, had, he was doing a sketch, a premise about ghosts. Mm. And he was like, and he says, you don't see any black ghosts. And so I said to him, actually you do, they're called spooks. Now that's uh see that's a uh, um <laughs> okay he's a white guy and I said look it's funny and he goes I'm not gonna say it I said if you don't say it I will <laughs> you know because it's funny okay and it's not you know it's basically I mean it's like a play on words but it's also it's a uh, um well it's what people say when they can't say nigger <laughs> right <laughs> said, right so, pretty much yeah I got yeah. it so. And he was like, I'm not going to, I'm not doing it. I said, okay, fine. I said, I'm telling you, it's perfectly good. And it's perfectly safe because unlike nigger, you can say spook and nobody's going to like lose their mind, you know, but well, you know, with nigger, some people might lose their mind. So it's, it's, yeah. it's funny. It's just as racist. It's just as racist. It's just funnier. And it fits right in his premise, but he wouldn't, mm -hmm. he wouldn't do it. He just kept saying there are no black ghosts, you know, and I was like, oh yeah, there are, they're called spooks, you know, but. <laughs> So. Yeah, I I definitely uh I I I'll say this. I can have a premise for something and if I can't like put something on it right away, I'll save it. I'll and I've I've had a joke that I have been working on and what a premise and I I've had it for over 6 months and I finally got to it not because of time but finally was able to craft that premise after having it for over six months because sometimes some stuff have to sit and age a little bit or get a little you know uh funky before you put that last little razzle dazzle on it you know i, I have a premise that i've been working on for nine years wow it's only, it's only been six months that i got it perfected wow and the thing is i thought i, I was doing an interview i was doing an interview but i hadn't it hadn't started recording yet no, I'm sorry. I wasn't. Wow. I was on the phone talking to another comedian, and I said, "This is the premise I'm working on." And I started doing it, and I did it for them. And they're cracking up, and I said, "This is it. This is it." And I lost it. I didn't. I didn't write it down because I thought I knew for certain that I would remember it, and I lost it for like wow. two months. And then I came up with something different, but and it works. It's worked every single time, mm. you know. And it's uncomfortable. It's extremely uncomfortable. Yeah. But it. But. It, Every people get it, and 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 afterwards they'll they'll say, you know, I felt really bad laughing at that, or I felt really guilty laughing at that, but it was funny, you know. I'll, I'll say, yeah, thank you. It's a really good premise. Said, yeah, it's not a premise; it actually happened. The way I wrote it is funny, you know. So <laughs> now, I hate that people are just kind of like uptight and feel like they can't laugh at you know certain things. Like, ah, oh, I hate it. I hate where it where comedy is going with that. Well, like I said, I, I tell young comedians that if you're not comfortable saying it, if you're not comfortable with it, the audience is not going to be comfortable with it. Okay. If you're comfortable with it, they'll come along for the ride. Even if they're a little uncomfortable at first, you know, they they'll they'll say they'll they'll feel comfortable. It's kind of like um taking you know taking somebody swimming to the lake or something. And they're like, I'm not, I'm not getting in that water. You say it's fine. There's no really, there's no gators out here. We're not big ones. They're just little gators. Come on, that's fine. You'll be mm -hmm. fine. Come in the water. And after a while, they see you swimming and having fun. They're like, okay, I'll come in the water. You know, unless they're really traumatized, then you have to. Yeah. Push them. Then you gotta drag them and hold their face under the water until no, until they stop screaming. <laughs> no, <laughs> oh, sorry. No. <laughs> no. So. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm I'm gonna pop the your your next clip in. It's from the same. I, I wrote down Comedy Factory and it's Comedy Cellar. Uh huh. That's it's why. Okay. That's, what, that's no. And I and I wrote it down from memory. I'm saying what well, was Comedy something. Uh huh. It, so Comedy Cellar. So this is the second clip um, from that same from the same sketch. I actually, picked up right where you left off. Okay. Okay. 
Speaking of police, I think teachers should get paid more than police. To be fair, to be fair, I don't have none against police. I think you got bad police and bad teachers. I'm just saying that when you're a police, they pay you to show up to the crime, but when you're a teacher, the crime scene comes to you. That's worth a little bit more money, right? So I'm over 40. Anybody in here over 40? Aww. It's just 10 of us. The rest of you are what? Millennials and Gen Zers? Listen, being over 40 is interesting. I'm noticing that a lot of women are getting these Brazilian butt lifts. <laughs> Seriously, y'all? I mean, just wear the pants underwear. <laughs> you know, like a padding just makes your butt thick. <laughs> no shame for me. I mean, it's the protection. <laughs> Seriously. I have an easier time holding in a secret than I do my pee. <laughs> You ever heard the term pissy drunk? Yeah, that's me. <laughs> Once that stream starts, woo, give pissy drunk a whole new meaning. <laughs> Man. So recently, uh, my coworker named Jill invited me to an all white party. Now Jill is white, she cool as shit, so I was excited that Jill invited me to her all white party. But I was a little confused. As you can tell, I'm black. And so what that means is to black folk, you show up to the party, your all white outfit. I mean, flies, you can fucking show up, right? So then I started to wonder, like, is this an all white party for all white clothes? Or do I gotta go in there and talk about like all white shit? <laughs> I mean, I don't know nothing about lacrosse or Perry Hannah. Like <laughs> nothing. <laughs> now, that all that is your there. What was that? What was the what was the makeup there? Oh, very eclectic. It's New York City, so you had people of all ethnicities and ages. Uh, it was it was just a good room. It was a good room. Now you play a lot of rooms in New York and Philly. So, what's the um, best, what's the best smelling place you performed in, and what's the worst smelling place you performed in? The, the the best place I performed in you best said? smelling you know because that's that's <laughs> see because that smell the sense of smell is what triggers us that triggers us more than almost anything else the sense of smell oh god I think mics smell the worst just because you know they're kind of just like holes in the walls uh you know people drinking and oh you I thought that was the name of a place you meant like just like like open mics yes I think open okay. mics are just you know for me i've i've been into like some some shitty places that are open mics that smell horrific because people are just drunk trying to riff off their you know their sets alcohol is you know filling the air smoking cigarettes whatever um and they they tend to be dark spots but i don't stop going because that's where you really just get your reps in right so for me i would say <laughs> open mics and now, so what's the best place you've ever performed in? Best smelling uh, place you performed in? The best smelling place? Then I would say the opposite. Then they got to be comedy clubs, even though there are comedy clubs that have open mics. See, when a comedy club have an open mic, they, they got a little different uh, type of setup and staff, right? You got the disgruntled, whatever. I'm just here a couple hours to let you, you know, fake ass comics, get up and do what you're going to do. While I, you know, I got to bust tables, but when you're actually performing and you're in a comedy show, they kind of curate a welcoming, more welcoming environment, and there's food lingering in the air. So yes, the aroma is great. <laughs> it's just like, is that the best smelling place I've ever performed in that I can remember that that, that triggers that I think it does is a pizza place. It was just an open mic, but it was a pizza really? place. Really. And it smelled great. It was just an open mic. The re the food just smelled so good. And the worst okay. one in the place, I was performing comedy. And this place had two stages. And they did the music upstairs, upstairs in the good place and the comedy mm. downstairs in the bad place. Mm. And I don't mean hell, because I think hell probably smelled better. Oh, but God. This place, I think the toilets had backed up like a month before. 
And I don't think they ever got the, got the smell out of the rug. They just what? covered it up with bleach and like pine saw. You know how old bleach and old pine saw gets together with old bleach? After a while, yeah, yeah. ew. And that's what the base, that's what that whole area, it just smelled like that. I was ew. like, I was like, ooh, <laughs> ooh. That's no. not good. Yeah, that's the worst smelling place. I, and I can't, I would say the name of the place, but I can't remember the name of the place. I just remember the town it was in. Um, but yeah, it was awful. And that's why I asked people that because like I said, the sense of smell is like the most triggering sense that we have. Okay. Uh, now, so who who's the, the most difficult person in your circle to make laugh? Even family, friends. Uh, you know, you hear was, that one laugh, you know, you, you know you've done it good. My your kids. kids yeah. How old are they? 15 and 17. Now, do they just not think you're funny or do they have comedians that just think that you're not? No, they, I think for them, okay. So my daughter, she'll like smile, but she'll be like, uh, I don't get it. I think you should say this or do this. And my son, he's just not really into it. But he, of course, they're too young to come to a comedy show that I do because they're under 21. But I recently, um, did the joke about me being a black hockey mom and him and all this stuff. And he saw it and he was like, Oh, this is good. This was good. So was he just fantasizes about beating up on white kids or he just thought no, joke? no, that's just <laughs> <laughs> no, that's just that's me when I'm like cheering him on, you know, uh in his games and stuff. But uh, because again, I take my life experiences and I just turn them into jokes. And so they don't get to hear a lot, but when I sh when I do share with them. Uh, my daughter, she'll be like, oh, I didn't get it. I don't know. But my son is like, oh, that's good. So they're kind of they're kind of tough. But if they do like it, I'm like, OK, then I'm definitely ready to try this out. Now, I know that you have uh, an appointment, so uh, I'm going to get I want to get to your third clip. And whenever you have to cut out, um, you know, just let me know. I, and or you could just keep the camera running and do your therapy session. On, you know, <laughs> You probably have to record your sessions anyway, so you might as well just. <laughs> All right. Well, while you think about it, I'm, while you're thinking, I'll play the next clip. Okay. You look, give me your answer on the other side. <laughs> so um, I enjoy living on the East Coast, and uh, recently I took a flight out to California, and nobody told me that that shit was going to be a six-hour hostage situation. <laughs> No cell phone, no food. Where was Liam Neeson when you needed him? Oh my God. Oh. So um, I heard somebody talk about marriage earlier. I've been married for 17 years. <laughs> no, nah, don't clap for that shit. Y'all don't know my life. But here's what it's like. You ever want to order something late at night but it's too late. So you get up, that lady knows. So you get up, you go to the kitchen, you put your stuff together, a turkey on rye with some mayo and lettuce. And it don't quite hit the spot, but it'll hold you over to the morning. Yeah, that's my marriage. Yeah, that's my marriage. So I'm gonna get out of here on this. Give you. Give yourself a round of applause for surviving the pandemic. Please. Yes. Shit was crazy, right? Very, thank you. You had white people storming the Capitol and got away with it. Oh my God. Right now, somebody has Nancy Pelosi stapler on their kitchen table. <laughs> Black folks was out here lying and getting PP loans and getting caught. <laughs> Meanwhile, you had Brett Farr stealing the welfare checks in Mississippi. Mississippi? Okay. Wow. Now, the most nefarious thing I did during a pandemic was drink hella wine and get fat. <laughs> Look, it was, it was a, a lot to get up here with this, okay? So my young girlfriends, they say, well, how did you get so fat? You wore a mask 18 hours a day. <laughs> young bitches, right? <laughs> I said, listen, that mask was like a pair of panties. You just pull it to the side and you slide the meat in. <laughs> You all have 
have been amazing. Thank you very much. My name is Dr. Holly. Okay. Okay. Dr. Holly, everybody. So, I'm, have you thought about recording the session, just leaving the camera on for the next session? Have you thought about it? <laughs> oh, God. Now, I, I have, um, I'm going to assume that you, at some point, would like to do your own comedy special. Um, I guess. I, um... I'll just say this. It's not like the number one thing on my list that I'm aiming for because, again, I write television and I'm really, really pressed to get my own television show. Mm -hmm. And so then if I kind of revert, because a lot of people, you know, do stand up, get a special and then do TV. For me, I kind of reverse engineer it. You know, I want to do my television show and then do a stand up, you know, after that, because it's just not, you know, like number one on my bucket list it's not even in the top three but it is there oh so because i had two titles two pro, pro, two pros two perspective titles okay for your show okay one okay. of them the first one is the doctor is in trouble again <laughs> and the, the second one is the second one is the doctor is in your business <laughs> oh okay <laughs> see so those are two those i just no, I just wanted to do something with the Doctor is in because that is like a pretty standard. Uh, it's like from the old peanuts it is. thing. The it old is. peanuts thing was Lucy had the therapy thing and it said the Doctor is in, the Doctor is out. It and is. So, <laughs> so, so I'll consider those. I'll oh, consider okay. those. Um, well, got a couple, I guess a minute before you have to go, I guess, right? About that. It's 257. Yeah. Yeah, I got time for another question or two. Okay. I don't know what you had. Oh, I got like it's the question is like this long. No, <laughs> actually, men, men always make it look like it's longer than it is. It's like the question is actually like this, but it's gonna feel like it's this long. Um. So, no, what? Uh, okay. Well, oh, who, who, or what are your comedy influences? Because you said you're like Larry, Larry David, but doesn't mean he's your influence. No, he's definitely not. Um. As far as influences, I would say I love Adele Givens and Nikki Glassier. Mm -hmm. I love um, Tina Fey. Mm -hmm. um, I would say those are my top three. Um, yeah, those are my top three. Because I find myself to be smart. I find myself to be... Um, you know, always politically incorrect. And I am not a clean comic. I will use the fucking curse word in a heartbeat, but I'm still a lady. I'm still classy when I am on that stage, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the three ladies that I describe or mention embody all of that. Um, so yeah, huge fans of those three ladies. Because so if they're your, your influences, how did you wind up being like Larry David? <laughs> no, because you had asked about we were talking about my husband and I was saying like oh, his okay. humor, his humor oh, gotcha. is kind of oh, like okay. a Seinfeld. Oh, and gotcha. then for on the opposite side, I'm more like my humor is more like a Larry David. Gotcha. But yeah, that's so, how we ended up there. Now, last question. Now, I'm I'm assuming that when just before a client comes in, a, new cli a client comes in, whether they're a new client or an old client, you have something of a ritual that you kind of like put yourself in that place. For that client because people are different so you may go you may have to go like okay here comes the kleptomaniac you know or you know say or here here here, here comes the abusive uh, the anger management guy okay so i'm sure now is that is the ritual for that different than the ritual for preparing to do comedy um Wow, that's deep, GD. That's, that's what deep. I do. That's that's what I do. That's deep. You know what? I think it depends on the room, right? Um, because I think with being a therapist, you have to pre prepare yourself for what's to come with a client, right? And mm -hmm. then kind of like with comedy, you got to prepare yourself what's in the room. You don't know if you're going to have a heckler there. You know if somebody's going to throw a beer can. So you kind of got to be in a mindset to be open for anything to possibly happen, which right. could be a beer can thrown at you or a heckler. So if those things happen, how do you, in the moment, 
you know, brace yourself. And that's why I find improv to be a very helpful tool because you have to think fast. And so having the skills of, of an improv background and do a comedy, it allows me to kind of like pivot and navigate. Being a therapist, I brace myself. So if something does happen or somebody is saying something or like that moment, I can I can sit with it, but I can shift really quick because again, people are coming in with these different type of problems that you, I mean, you think you've heard it, but sometimes you have not heard it all. Now, being a therapist, because listening, let's put it this way, it's healing and hurting are, again, they're like two sides of the same sword, healing and hurting, okay. they're so close. You know, if you know how to, if you know how to heal someone, you know how to hurt them just as well, if you just flip it. So okay. you being a therapist, you're kind of like in the healing arts, but it seems to me like if you were in a roast battle, you could like really hurt somebody just because you could hear, you could tell from their breathing, their voice, the <laughs> patterns, you know, what what gets them. Like, they, you know, like they may, you may say something like, um, you know, your dad and you like see them swallow, like, look, you know, so you know, okay, that's going to do, that's going to hurt. Or okay. their voice, or they'll, or they'll say something about you, but their voice cracks. So, you know, that's their kryptonite. So yes. as a therapist, you must, you know, have you, first of all, have you done, any roast battles and do no. you use your do you use your powers for good or evil in that place <laughs> okay so i have not done any roast battles i use my powers for good whenever somebody has heckled me i've only been heckled once in tampa at tampa improv but now it's called a funny bone um three if i am in a space like with other comics at a mic or i'm on a show I use my therapist body sense to kind of sense the energy in the room to like right. which comedians to connect with um, or towards the audience to like, I'll have jokes that I want to say, but I watch other comics before me. I'll fill the room and depending on the audience, I'll switch up my whole set and won't oh. go with what I um, have written down. People say, why do that? That's when you can really go in. No, because for me, I'm not there to like trip up the crowd or punch down. I'm there to deliver a good show. And if I know reading the room that I can deliver a great show by just switching up those jokes, um, then that's what I'm gonna do. So it's not even, it's about me. And see, I kind of agree with you. I don't, I don't punch down at the audience either. I, I kick up like right toward the gonads. I kick up. I don't punch <laughs> down. So I, I agree with you about punching down. I disagree about punching. I just kick up. No, I'm just, I'm there just, you go. No, there I'm, you go. No, I'm, I'm just I'm, obviously I'm just messing. I, I I believe the audience is number one. I don't say the audience is always right unless they're laughing with me. <laughs> right, right. I definitely think the audience is number one because they paid. They want to see a good show. Yes, Do I think yes. they're always right? No. But yeah. again you give them that show and so that's why i mean by like no i'll go in i see my audience i'm gonna give them that show but there's that so all right gd i gotta roll all right, well i thank you for doing this with me sure i appreciate it uh and i will um once i get this all edited down i will send you a little blurb let you know yeah. when it's up and uh it's and like i said i would promote a show but by the time this could, this will probably be like a week or two before I finish editing. I, I'm like, I'm trying to finish editing it this weekend, which is why I did it today. It gives me a couple of days to edit. Yeah, it's not rush. But, you know, but I will let you know as soon as it's up and ready. Sure. And, and I really okay. appreciate you doing this with me. You got me. it. You and got uh, it. thanks a lot. You, you're welcome. Anytime. Talk right. to you soon. Okay, tomorrow. Thanks. Okay. You know, not just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good one. All right. No, bye. Bye. I'm not going to lie. 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 I